Did you know this podcast is powered by Acast? Acast is the home of podcasting for creators looking for freedom to grow their listeners and make money too. And creative brands looking for smart ways to advertise. Podcasters and advertisers in the know know Acast. It's time you did too. Visit Acast.com to find out more. Acast for the stories. Hello, this is Lawfare intern Christiana Wayne with a podcast from the Lawfare Archives for July 11th, 2021. Last month, we found out that the Trump-era Justice Department sought the emails and phone records of several reporters at the New York Times, Washington Post, and CNN who were involved in sometimes critical coverage of the president and his administration. This revelation adds new depth to the already adversarial relationship between the former president and members of the press. For today's episode from the archives, I chose to go back to August 2020 when Jack Goldsmith spoke to Harold Holzer, director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, about his book, The President vs. the Press. They talk about the long and interesting re- history of the relationship between the presidency and the press, and why Trump versus the press may not be the nadir of the relationship that some may think it is. I'm Jack Goldsmith, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, August 25th, 2020. I sat down with Harold Holzer, director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College, about his new book, The Presidents versus the Press, the endless battle between the White House and the media from the Founding Fathers to fake news. We discussed the long and interesting history of the contentious relationship between presidents and the press and how President Trump's relationship with journalists has many precedents and is not the low point in president-press relations. We also discussed the likely arc of the battle between the White House and the media after Trump leaves office. It's the Lawfare Podcast, August 25th. Harold Holzer on the Presidents versus the Press. Uh, you cover in, in amazingly interesting detail the disputes and confrontations and anxieties between presidents and journalists going back to the beginning of the country. One of the themes that I discerned anyway in the book, and maybe a, maybe a subtext as it's called, is that we all think of Donald Trump as having historically unprecedentedly antagonistic relationship with the press. But your book is a way of kind of calling that conventional wisdom into question. Is, is that fair? Yeah, I think it's absolutely fair and probably um, more than a subtext. Give us the highlights for why, uh, you know, people think of Trump as being un- un- unprecedentedly vicious towards the press, but you know, as you point out, there, there are episodes throughout history which were in some ways much worse than what Trump has done. I mean, I think the reason perhaps we think of Trump as doing more damage to the traditional relationship of the press and the White House is that his message is intensified by daily briefings ostensibly on coronavirus, but ultimately each containing some sort of an incident and blowback against a journalist. And because the rest of his um, anger is communicated on uh, on Twitter, which reaches tens of millions of people in an instant, and for those it doesn't reach, it reaches the messages reach because the mainstream press and the broadcast press carry those tweets as the uh, major news of the day. So we're confronted repeatedly with the manifestations of Trump's anger at the press. And frankly, the press is anger at him uh, because he's criticized and accused of fabrications more more than any of his predecessors. But my argument is that in a way, aside from the high technology he uses, his bark has been much worse than the bite of other presidents. And yet, yes, absolutely, George Washington for sure got really furious at the press at the end of his first term and throughout the second. And but John Adams and Abraham Lincoln prosecuted newspaper men and um, had more than a few imprisoned during their presidencies. And I think that, you know, can arguably be considered a worse threat than, than, than bombast. 
Uh, Woodrow Wilson imprisoned a few editors in his day in the name of national security. And Barack Obama uh, wiretapped reporters and in some cases their families. So I'm just suggesting that this is nothing new, but that it seems to be carried with more frequency on the World Wide Web. So I'm, when we get to Trump at the end of the podcast, I'm going to suggest that there may be something new. But your, your point is well taken that you know there's nothing like the Alien and Sedition Acts or what was going on in the Civil War or World War One and Two in terms of presidents shutting down the press and censoring the press and the like. And putting it in that historical context, I think, is very useful. So tell us about the press in the 1790s. It was, in many ways, it was like the press today, and in some ways not. How would you characterize the nature of the American press at the dawn of the Republic? Well, there were very few newspapers. They were usually published weekly. Eventually, they became bi-weeklies, not dailies for a while. Not many copies printed. Many of the publishers used hand presses in the, in the 18th century. So you can imagine how precious uh, a newspaper was, but also how electric it was to get news, how exciting it was. You know, up to 40 people would read a single newspaper. They were so precious and, and coveted. So Washington wanted a press in the national capital of Philadelphia, but he wanted it to be nonpartisan and sort of just reporting him as the ongoing national hero without criticism. Something unusual happened, even by today's standards, I think. His own Secretary of State, who happened to be of a different party and happened to be Thomas Jefferson, imported a guy to start a pro-Republican. In those days, Jefferson was a Republican slash Democrat, so I'm just going to say Republican to make it simple. A Republican newspaper to start up in Philadelphia in opposition to the pro-Washington, pro-Federalist paper. And not only did he encourage it to establish itself, he hired the editor as a translator in the State Department to offer him a subvention so that he could afford to start the paper. And before long, Benjamin Franklin's grandson started another anti-Washington paper. So Washington is not only the first president, he's the first president to be criticized brutally by by opposition journalists, establishing this partisan phenomenon that begins with Washington, sort of dwindles at the end of the 19th century, kind of to be replaced by news emphasis and by yellow journalism, and then comes back in the era of Bill Clinton, I think. That's where I trace its origins with the advent of and the proliferation of talk radio and CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, maybe even a little earlier. And Clinton. So we'll get to we'll get we'll get to those changes. I was struck. I knew this, but you had some great examples of just how incredibly vicious the, the newspapers were, especially towards Washington, and how much it got to him. Yeah, I mean his aides, I mean including Vice President John Adams, who was really thin-skinned, and Jefferson, who was pretty cool usually, both sort of um, noted and kind of gloated, I think, about Washington's thin skin and about his temper. And they saw examples of, you know, little tantrums that he had. And he was a pretty big man, so the tantrums must have been phenomenal. And that included throwing a newspaper to the ground and stomping on it with his boots, yelling about what he was being subjected to and how he'd love to go home to Mount Vernon and give it all up. What did he need it for? And to Washington, the reports that questioned everything from his diplomatic policies to his personality. I mean, he was, this is a guy who was practically a, a secular saint in America when he became president. He was criticized for, you know, a pomposity, lavishing attention on himself, stealing money from the federal government by faking his expenses. It was brutal. So, I was surprised to learn, you stated or speculated, that the relentless press attacks on Washington contributed as, as much to his decision not to seek a third term as the principle of the matter. That, that's a remarkable claim. Yeah, I, I, I know we make much of Washington wanting to avoid kind of a royal succession as president and wanting to get out after two terms to set the precedent of going home. 
But I do think the press drove him out of office. He might indeed have gone for a third term. And I know that, or we should know that, from the first draft of his his famous farewell address. Um, he made it quite clear in a draft that he sent to Alexander Hamilton for editing that he was tired of the press and that he was, frankly, being driven home because of the abuse he, he had uh, tolerated. And when Hamilton sent him back sent him back his edits. He said, you know, it's in so many respectful ways, he said, that's kind of like whining. And he advised that it be deleted. By the way, I just, as a secondary point, can you imagine this precious, iconic paper being sent back and forth by the U.S. Post Office in 1792? It's just extraordinary, but it was. I also think the farewell address might have been remembered a little bit differently if they'd kept that passage in, because it was very whiny and bitter. It was certainly bitter. I agree with you. It would not have been about nonpartisanship and uh, maintaining freedom. I, I agree with you absolutely. Okay, I wanna, I'm going to skip over Adams. I think many of our listeners will know about the Sedition Acts. It's a famous act in American history. And its attack on the press is well known, and the debates it spurred are pretty well known. But I want to I want to quote this amazing quote from Jefferson because you present Jefferson as someone who was really also upset about his press treatment, more committed to press freedoms in theory, and ultimately in practice, even though he really bristled against it. But here's an amazing quote from Jefferson that could have been written in you know 2020. This is Thomas Jefferson. Nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being put into that polluted vehicle. I will add that the man who never looks into a newspaper is better informed than he who reads them, inasmuch as he who knows nothing is nearer to the truth than he whose mind is filled with falsehoods and errors. That's Jefferson's description of newspapers of the day. And then the next sentence of your book says, by then, the laws in his home state of Virginia codified the ancient tradition of, quote, punishing divulgers of false news, unquote. So it's like nothing has changed. So it, as in other areas, such as um, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and all men are created equal, Jefferson occasionally speaks from both sides of his mouth. And where press freedom is concerned, he believed in it, but he didn't always practice it. He pros- He believed in prosecuting libel cases on the state level, which is probably as objectionable as a federal sedition act. But this is a man who had founded newspapers, who had founded anti-federalist newspapers, who had supported them. And at the end of his life, he is assailing newspaper coverage. In the end, Jefferson objected when journalists criticized him, and he applauded when they criticized the federalists. And uh, I don't, in a way, it's no different than other politicians in that regard. Yeah, but that's that's understandable. But he didn't really take any actions against the press. Jefferson, I think, made it clear he opposed the Sedition Act for sure. And I think he had a very good point about it. And that is that Sedition Act complaints by the Adams administration against journalists who ridiculed the president, which was by then a federal offense, would all be judged in federal courts whose judges were appointed by Federalists. So they were going to be more inclined to protect the Federalist line because there had only been Federalist presidents for the first three cycles. But Jefferson never said he that he believed that journalists could write with impunity about presidents. He was just such a states' rights guy that he believed that, the, that libel uh, action should proceed in the state level. So again, it's a difference without a distinction, or is it a distinction without a difference? But he also thought it shouldn't be made illegal in advance, didn't he? I mean, he thought it should exactly. be done in after the, after the fact actions in state state common law. Absolutely. Um, and meanwhile, those state laws were being liberalized, even as actions were being brought against uh, Federalist newspapers for objecting to Jefferson. So yeah, I mean, people are sorting out the the limits and the meaning of the First Amendment. I guess it wasn't considered quite as sacred as uh, Floyd Abrams, thank goodness, has meant has made it. No, it definitely wasn't. It definitely wasn't nearly as sacred then. So how much you talk about at the beginning of the book, the press is as important an institution as the presidency. 
Was that true? I mean, when did, was that true in the first 50 years of the Republic? How big an institution, how consequential an institution were these journalists who were giving presidents a hard time? I think they were consequential because they were the only communications game in towns and villages and cities across the country. And I think because the press played such a role in uh, in arousing people and uh, turnout where people could vote popularly in the 1800 contest between Adams and Jefferson, that I think their role was growing exponentially as each cycle uh, came and went. And I think part of that was due not only to the stirring up of partisan passions, as Washington would have put it, but also the technologies improving. Uh, newspapers being able to publish daily, being able to circulate, being able to create little networks in advance of wire services or even the telegraph, uh, where news, common news could be carried by, let's say, a uh, a group of pro-federalist newspapers from New England to Virginia. And I think Jefferson, uh, again, was one of the people who helped create this. He created a Republican network of newspapers. He created his own his own newspaper in Washington, D.C. when he became president and moved into the White House and then um, set another president by awarding the chosen editor government printing contracts and social status to keep him in the fold. But again, you know, he also could have avoided the worst story he ever he ever was faced with had he been a little savvier about that new relationship, reward and uh, performance relationship that he himself had created. But he, he messed up in that one aspect. So you're a scholar. You've written a lot of books about Abraham Lincoln, scholar of Lincoln, and you have a great chapter on Lincoln. You quote something that I've quoted before in different contexts. I'm going to read it now. And I think this is an insight that every president, at least from Lincoln, had and maybe before. And that's the following. This is a quotation from Abraham Lincoln. Public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. Consequently, he who molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who act, enacts statutes or pronounces decisions. Unquote. The idea being that if the president has the support of the people, he can do a lot of things. Uh, and if he doesn't have the support, he can't. And therefore, the implicit the implication is that having that support is absolutely vital. And then you also go on to say, and this is the thesis of the chapter, I think, that no president has ever controlled public opinion more firmly than Abraham Lincoln. Can you explain that? Sure. And I think it's both a positive and a negative accomplishment. Um, I, I must say, I use that quote promiscuously, and it's a, I've used it in the last book I wrote on Lincoln and the press. And um, I do want to just do a little bit of a mea culpa about it. I mean, he did say that in a Lincoln-Douglas debate. And when he's saying that public sentiment is more important than statutes, he is specifically criticizing his opponent, Stephen A. Douglas, who has enacted a possibly unpopular statute in the Kansas-Nebraska Act. He's criticizing the Supreme Court for ruling against freedom in the Dred Scott decision. And Lincoln is just you know, a guy who's trying to win public sentiment because he doesn't hold office and he can't enact statutes. Maybe I should have spent time on that in the book. But anyway, just a grain of salt, correction of my to my own writing. But yeah, I think Lincoln had the greatest impact on journalism for two reasons, again, both positive and negative. On the positive side, he spent 10 years befriending pro-Whig and pro-Republican editors so that they would maintain loyalty and support for him no matter what. And he carried that that foundation of support to Washington, uh, expanding his influence on the New York Times, the New York Tribune, big, big newspapers, cutting some deals with the, the most independent of the big papers, the New York Herald, to even if it meant promising its uh, its owner an ambassadorship in France. So he kept positive control. He also had very good sense of using the telegraph to move his messages, often messages that he wrote to individuals, sending them out to newspapers around the country as kind of what we call public letters to express his opinion on key issues, including control of the press. And that's 
the negative side. In addition to communicating brilliantly, sometimes deceptively, I might add, Lincoln also clamped down on dissent. And he argued that during the Civil War, and this is one of the great unresolved questions, at least in the Lincoln community, was this the appropriate legal thing to do? He believed he had a war power that entitled him to suspend the writ of habeas corpus originally without the consent of Congress. And I know it's kind of vague in the Constitution about who can do that, arguing that in times of civil war, you can suspend the writ. Therefore, he had newspaper editors arrested, newspaper offices shut down, uh, the post office. I keep raising the post office for obvious reasons, but the post office refused newspaper mailings and refused to mail newspapers that were anti-war out to the country. The army closed down papers, threw editors in prison without civilian or even military trial, just threw away the key in some cases. So there was kind of a mini reign of terror at the same time that Lincoln is using the telegraph. And by the way, at the same time that the government has taken over the telegraph so that disobliging stories cannot be sent on the wires to even supportive newspapers. And his justification, as I recall, was basically military necessity. He said it was necessary to do these things to win the war and that the reason people didn't need to worry about it is because these press freedoms would be restored as soon as the war was over. Right. And he used his old, longtime punching bag, Andrew Jackson, who suddenly became his hero. He put his painting in, uh, in his cabinet room and talked about how manly he had been in uh, resisting uh, secession efforts when he was president. But Jackson had taken over the press in New Orleans after the battle there in the War of 1812 and then relaxed those restrictions. And that was his model. Or as he put it, you know, he doesn't think anyone in the world develops such a uh, such a taste for emetics, meaning purging medications, uh, to develop a taste for them that he would use them when he wasn't sick. That was Lincoln's analogy about why press restrictions would be impractical and unpalatable, literally, once the rebellion was, was put down. And you also talk about uh, Lincoln engaging in deceptive communications, manipulating the press, disinformation. What are some examples? I think the big example is the run-up to the Emancipation Proclamation the preliminary proclamation. Lincoln drafted it in July of 1862. His cabinet convinced him to shelve it until a Union battlefield victory could give it some ballast so it wouldn't be seen, as Lincoln put it, as a last shriek on the retreat. And he wouldn't issue it for two more months to the day. And in those two months, he used the press masterfully, and yes, a bit deceptively, to lay the groundwork for a proclamation that he believed could not be presented to white voters, even progressive ones, as a philanthropic or benevolent gesture for African Americans. He believed racism was so ingrained that white voters, even pro-war voters, would not accept it. And with an off-year election mm -hmm. rapidly approaching, he thought the Republican Party would be ruined. And then the rebellion, the fight against the rebellion abandoned if he wasn't careful. So he did two things that were pretty extraordinary. He welcomed a group of free African-Americans to the White House. That was the good news part. The bad news is he entered the room with an AP stenographer at his side and proceeded to lecture them for being the cause of the war. White men cannot and black men could not live together. He said, it's best for us to be separated. And he asked his visitors to consider his new plans or the government's new plans for voluntary colonization in the Caribbean or Africa. I think the men who were all citizens of Washington who had lived there far longer than Lincoln were pretty puzzled, but they were very respectful. They went back to their organizations and churches and wrote a very polite reply saying, no, thank you. And that's where it ended. But because there was a stenographer there, this message went around the country. If you look at the progressive editorial responses, people thought Lincoln was brilliant, magnificent. 
this is just what we need. They, this is the right move. And you, it's a suggestion that wasn't his real view, that that was a way to massage public opinion, to get to support public opinion for the Emancipation Proclamation? It's hard to know exactly when Lincoln abandoned a, a longstanding belief in voluntary colonization, uh, the kind that was fathered by his political hero, Henry Clay. Colonization societies were considered progressive and philanthropic at one point in our history. So did Lincoln believe in it? A little bit. And, and you know, he, there was a congressional appropriation to establish an experimental colony in Santo Domingo. He didn't spend all the money, which makes me think his heart wasn't completely in it. So I would say he did harbor some interest in it until African-Americans began fighting in the Civil War for their own freedom the following March. So at the moment, he has some interest in it. But I think the more important message is convince white voters that if emancipation comes, it's going to be accompanied by a kind of a plan. I mean, there was never a plan that could move four million people. That was never going to happen. So I think it was mostly public relations. Hey, podcaster, meet ACAST. We're the top independent podcast network for creators in the know. We empower you to develop your podcast idea, find your audience, and grow listener relationships, wherever those listeners are. You'll also find a whole range of ways to make money, from membership plans for paying fans to our fully curated and creative advertising experience. Visit acast.com slash network to find out more. Acast, for the stories. So you said earlier that journalism started to change at the turn of the 20th, at the, between the 19th and 20th century. And um, also the presidency started to change in the way it used the press and, and in establishing a more direct relationship between the presidency and the people and in efforts both to massage the press more and to circumvent the press to reach the people. Jeffrey Tullis calls this the rise of the rhetorical presidency, starting with T.R., uh, Teddy Roosevelt, getting really going with Wilson when Wilson would, for example, re reinstituted the State of the Union address, start making policy speeches and larger policy speeches for national audience and growing chummier with the press. How would you how would you characterize this transition in the early 20th century? I think it, the, the rise of the rhetorical presidency is um, should be uh, considered side by side with this this sea change in the relations between the president and the press, because even though Lincoln was a figure um, known for his great rhetoric, speeches printed in the papers all the time and was also a familiar figure to Americans, um, a very personally connected president because of the ubiquity of photographs and lithographs, engravings, caricatures. The press changed first. And uh, with with the, uh, the coming of Adolf Ox and the uh, kind of nonpartisan New York Times, which took mm -hmm. over from Henry Raymond's earnestly pro-Republican New York Times. Remember, when Lincoln ran for re-election, Henry Raymond was editor of the Times, chairman of the Republican National Committee, and a Republican candidate for Congress, and a biographer of Lincoln, sort of a message promulgator, the David Axelrod of the campaign, all in one year. So that changed. And by the time of TR, I mean, this is a perfect meeting of personality and, and the changing culture of the press. TR was a brilliant, he was energetic, he was an idea person, and he took advantage of the fact that the heroes of journalism were no longer editors like Henry Raymond and Horace Greeley. They were the, the line reporters who wrote sensational stories. I mean, Pulitzer and Hearst were famous as publishers, but the reporters are the ones who did independent work in Washington. At the same time, we had T.R. who genuinely enjoyed journalists. So T.R. did two things. For policy support, he coddled and encouraged and gave time to long-form magazine journalists uh, like uh, Ida Tarbell and Lincoln Steffens and Ray Baker. And their magazine articles on the meatpacking industry scandals, on uh, Standard Oil, sort of inspired and made possible the legislating of anti-truck policies that Roosevelt championed. Of course, Roosevelt discarded them later. 
and labeled them as muckrakers, which was not considered a flattering term when he had done with them. At the same time, he sort of charmed and entertained White House correspondents. And these were the first White House correspondents to get their own official press room in the White House. They didn't have to wait on the steps or at the gate to catch uh, William McKinley when he was walking in and out of the mansion. In fact, he had reporters into the a hallway adjacent to the Oval Office, the new Oval Office, every afternoon when he submitted to his daily shave by a barber. And the reporters would crowd into this corridor and ask him questions as he was being shaved. And eventually mm -hmm. got so into this practice that they would purposely ask provocative questions when the barber was holding the straight razor at TR's neck to see if they could get him to jump up and wave his arms and endanger himself. It became kind of a game, which I think TR was on to also. You have two chapters on FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, because he it was a hugely important player in changing the relationship between the presence and the press. And also he had four terms. What were his central innovations? First of all, the ubiquity of his press conferences. And I would add that I just wanted to correct any impression that I thought that Ro that Wilson was as friendly with the press. The press didn't like Wilson. They they found him chilly and professorial and didn't like the way he answered questions. With TR and Wilson, all the press conferences were off the record. So FDR continues the off-the-record press conference tradition, but he has a slew of them. He has two short of 1,000 press conferences in his 12 years and one month as president. You know, there were events, twice a week events. The journalists would crowd into the Oval Office. They would find Roosevelt, you know, smoking a cigarette or fiddling with a, his cigarette holder, his ivory cigarette holder. It was off the record. It was friendly. It was teasing. It was bantering. But he also got mad. He also attacked publishers. He attacked the journalists he didn't like. He, he once gave a German cross pretend German cross to a reporter from the New York Daily News because he thought its editorials had tilted too much against American intervention in World War II. The press maybe thought it had gone a little too far at that point. But Roosevelt's charm was such that a gentleman's agreement rose up from the time he ran for president in 1932, eventually and more tightly enforced by the government itself, that there would be no photographs taken, and certainly not none published, of FDR in his wheelchair or struggling in and out of automobiles. Well, he didn't struggle. He was lifted in and out of automobiles or coming down the gangplanks of ships. And the journalists, you know, bought into this. So this was the first major effort at concealment of a president's physical condition. Wilson had suffered a stroke. Everybody knew he was in terrible shape, but they didn't get the news, so they, they didn't exactly conceal it. They just were unable to report it. With Roosevelt, there was a bit of purposeful concealment around, and also the faking of uh, health reports that indicated that he was in perfect health. This was kind of, it seems to me, the high point, maybe it wasn't quite the high point, but a high point of the journalist as kind of, kind of the opposite of the founding. The journalist as clubby insider, the journalist as you know, the president cultivating the press by giving, you know, charming them in, in private. FDR, did, I mean, TR and Wilson did some of that, but Roosevelt did it a lot more. They they kind of accepted his message and they were largely, not everyone, but mouthpieces. Is that fair? Yeah, I looked for a smoking gun. I looked for a letter from the press office that said, guys, give the guy a break or, you know, some photographer's association mandate that they should do so. None exists as far as I can tell, but there are, you know, reminiscences by photographers of the day who said, you know, he was such a good guy. He was trying to help the country. We didn't want to get in his way. So we just agreed to do it. It seemed like the right thing to do. And you would not, of course, see that attitude today, uh, but it was certainly pervasive. And yet at the same time, and you, you asked what Roosevelt's major innovations were. The, the other major innovation is that he was the first American president really to use uh, new technologies to go around the press. 998 news conferences off the record, 28 or 29, depending on how you count, fireside chats, intimate radio addresses, 
infrequent. Although if you talk to people who lived through it, as I did to my own parents, they thought he was on as often as Burns and Allen and Jack Benny. But they were very rare, and yet they were so triumphant and so must-see or, I guess, must-hear radio that they created a new wall of communications for, or a new means of communications for the president. The journalists did not quite realize what was happening to them. A, it was the rise of certainly a broadcast as a legitimate rival of print, but it was also Roosevelt going around scrutiny and speaking directly to the American people. So you said earlier that you thought a big break came in the 90s and during the Clinton administration, a big change in presidential press relations. I would have thought that the first big, next big transformation came in the late 60s and early 70s with the Pentagon Papers case and Vietnam and, and then Watergate. This idea that the relationship had been too chubby, that it was adversarial, that the press really, in, in my understanding of it, developed a much more self-conscious professional sense of they had an important job to do in challenging the presidency, questioning uh, the president's representation of things, and that they were kind of empowered by the Pentagon Papers. Was that an how, how important was that period in the presidential press relations? Oh, I, I think empowerment is a great word. Not only the Pentagon Papers, but the ability of the press to so relentlessly cover the Watergate cover-up, and um, and I say maybe a little bit cruelly uh, in the book, I think the dream that every journalist since has harbored that maybe uh, they could become as famous and as wealthy as uh, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward and maybe even be played in a movie by Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford. It doesn't get much better than that. Or to be played by uh, Meryl Streep as Catherine Graham uh, going, after the, uh, going after the Pentagon Papers. So, yeah, I do think the culture shifted with Nixon. But the, the seismic shift I pointed to in the Clinton years was because of the coincidence of the rise, and really the huge imprint of partisan journalism returning. Nixon thought journalism was partisan because he didn't think he got a break from the press from the time he was prosecuting or persecuting Alger Hiss as a congressman, as a senator. He hated the press. And, and doubted their fairness from that moment forward. And of course, you know, it proceeds on a steady arc to denouncing the press when he loses for governor of California, controlling the message when he returns the big comeback as president, creating an enemies list, denying access. But yes, the press is emboldened, but by in the Clinton era, we have partisan journalism as a fixed fact. Maybe just as, you know, the hateful Spiro Agnew warned about when he was you know, sent out on the road to rage against nattering nabobs of negativity, as he so absurdly, alliteratively put it. By the Clinton era, you have the high watermark of talk radio, you have the first stirrings of the internet, and you have entrenched cable news. You have Fox News entering the scene. You have CNN entering the scene. And you have this, what I thought was a toxic combination of gotcha journalism and new technologies that made every move that Bill Clinton made or had made subject to investigation and press inquiry. And, you know, not only things that he deserved to be questioned about, but things that look in history, or at least my reading of history, to have been you know, unfair, ridiculous, diversionary, a waste of time, like Whitewater, like uh, the so-called travel gate, like the inquiries into Vincent Foster's suicide, things that the press should have left alone, in my view, or done as one-day stories, as we call them. And why, why did this happen? Was it was it just the technology? Was it the 24-7 news cycle on cable news? It was a kind of all of the above, I think. And I think it was also, I think there was a visceral dislike of Bill Clinton. You know, I should add that I find him very likable. I think I made my biases clear in the book about him. And not just because he was the only living president who, who allowed me to question him about his relations with the press, but I've always liked President Clinton. Full disclosure, he appointed me in 2000 to be the chairman of the U.S. Lincoln Bicentennial Commission, so I should put that on the disclosure list. But 
I think they they thought he was getting away with murder, as Joe Klein put it. Now, Joe Klein is a reporter who was really close up and personal with Clinton during the 1992 campaign. He was on the plane with him. Clinton shot the breeze with him every day. And little did Clinton know that Joe Klein was making furious notes for the novel that he would anonymously publish uh, called (laughs) Primary Colors about how he was getting away with uh, sexual indiscretions and promiscuity and, you know, using his wife to cover for him and uh, come to charging to the rescue. And and I have a quote from Klein later in the book. You know, what was it about Clinton that made the press react in this strange way? And he said it was as if, you know, we'd all lived through the 60s. We'd all done things. And David Gergen said the same thing, by the way, who worked for Clinton. We all did things we didn't want to do. And we all skated. And Clinton, not that we didn't want to do that. We're sorry we did. Clinton skated and he was sort of our guilt trip. It was like our indiscretions were going to be exposed if we didn't expose Clinton's. I think there's some weird psychological impulse to subjecting him to more criticism and scrutiny and relentless uh, spotlighting than any president had ever endured. Let's jump ahead to, to Donald Trump. So first of all, characterize there's been a lot written about Trump's use of social media, his, his very extremely antagonistic relationship with the press, his showmanship tactics in controlling news flow that he wants to control, and in the press's reaction to Trump. And just, just tell us what you think about that whole array of things. Yeah, I, um, I, and I can't wait to hear your take on it. So I think, you know, in a way, Trump is part of this tradition that, as you said at the outset of our conversation, dates back to George Washington, the natural antipathy uh, between journalists and the press, usually healthy, sometimes excessive, as in the Clinton era. I also think he is, like FDR with radio, like John Kennedy with television news conferences, like Barack Obama with the at the advent of the the internet, he is a master of a platform reaching tens of millions of people every time he has the whim to to communicate. And of course, I mean Twitter and other social media platforms. And I think where the press has fallen down, and I think they're doing a better job of resisting these days, maybe because we're, again, in an election cycle. But his tweets lead the day's news the way the early edition of the New York Times used to lead the day's news or an AP wire story would lead the day's news. Television used to do its morning broadcast based on what the Times had written that put out at 10 o'clock the night before. And now all the presidential coverage seems to emanate from uh, Trump's bitterest tweet storms in the early morning, from heaven knows what venue he's writing from, and probably we don't want to know. So isn't isn't this, isn't his control of Twitter and the... and dominance of the news cycle, isn't this something that is new in the sense that Roosevelt, with fireside chats, found ways to communicate directly with the people. Other presidents did as well. But Trump is communicating and commenting on events and controlling the agenda and making announcements kind of 24-7. Ben Wittes and Susan Hennessy described it as a fireside chat or a fireside rant but one that has no beginning and no end. And isn't this something just different in kind from what's happened before? Absolutely. And I think part of it is personality driven. It's his Trump's constant need to be the center of attention and center stage. But part of it is the inescapable nature of the changing technology. Listen, when George Washington published his farewell address in a little Philadelphia newspaper that was unsuspecting about being given the gift of exclusivity, it was as as much of a lightning bolt as a major tweet from President Trump, probably because of the infrequency as opposed to the frequency. But yeah, I mean, he's he's simply master. And I, I try in the book to relate how he first latched on to Twitter and how he recognized it as a new means that would be important, a new means of communication that would that suited him. And I joke, you know, maybe it was because his, you know, limited attention span uh, was so well suited to a 
platform that only allowed at that time a very small number of characters in each message. So I think, you know, the, the, the technology and the communicator met it was kind of a perfect storm for that reason. And sure, it's a fireside rant every minute because he's taking advantage of the technology and maybe taking advantage of the fact that he is more important with his messaging now, or at least equally important than the press. Yeah, and he—I mean—he communicates. I think he's up to eighty something million now directly. That's just, you know, that really does circumvent the press, and as you say, it does control their agenda. You describe Trump as as unconstrained. We haven't talked about the extent to which he lies and and attacks institutions and people in novel ways, unprecedented ways. But you also have a story about the press being kind of unrestrained, right? Yeah, I mean, well, I I, I still I absolutely agree that the press is you know, but one of the pillars of the republic that he is chipping away at in terms of questioning all of the all of the things that actually make America great. But I don't know if the press is complicit, but I think on occasion they're too complacent. I, I am kind of surprised at the kind of questions I've been hearing at the daily briefings in recent weeks, now that the president has resumed daily briefings, I mean, I remember a day when um, a Dan Rather would ask really pointed questions and that there would be booing and applause in some forums. I think they're not questioning as closely as they did because they don't want to be in the in the glare of one of his attacks on nasty women or wise guy or smart ass question complaints. So you think they've become timid in the face of Donald Trump? I think they're more timid in that press room than they are in their commentary on air. How do you explain all the lies you've told uh, that we heard, you know, in August is kind of grandstanding and not meant to do anything but provoke a tirade. But, you know, no, it, it, there haven't been enough questions on the post office, as far as I'm concerned, on the silencing of Dr. Fauci and um, Dr. Burks. I think people are, are again, I mean, he is a, a, he's a force of nature and you know, he's like that hurricane that he said was going to go to Alabama one day. He's kept the hurricane twirling, and I think it's very hard to stop it. How has the press performed in general in covering him? And there's a range of views. One is that they've been super aggressive and have done a great job in telling us everything that's going on inside the Trump administration. Another view is that the press has descended into old time partisanship as bad as it has been before, that opinion and fact are being mixed in news stories that journalistic outlets now have a much more of a political slant like they did in prior times. I'm just wondering, what, what is your kind of general account of how the press has reformed and how, it's, how it has reformed and performed during the Trump administration? I absolutely agree that we have gone back both uh, on television and to a lesser degree in print, but it's coming, to the kind of partisan journalism that existed in the 19th century. And I think we're back in the position where readers and viewers are getting the news from the platforms of their choice to the platforms that are aligned most closely with their own increasingly entrenched political views. Uh, a visitor to the United States in the Jackson era attended a political event and then picked up two newspapers uh, the next morning, a Democratic paper and a Whig paper, and did not recognize the event from the way that it had been reported in those party newspapers. I think the same can be said, you know, just looking at the commentary on Fox and MSNBC after the days of the Democratic Convention. You watch what you're comfortable with. You're not watching nonpartisan news. And to some extent, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the New York Post have become party, or at least uh, philosophically uh, aligned newspapers. So I think we're seeing a change in print coverage back to the old model as well. Now, there's nothing sacred about the new model or the newer model as opposed to the old model. I just think we have to, we should probably recognize that we're in to an, another era of philosophy uh, indoctrinated and philosophy aligned journalism and deal with it on that basis. But is that it? You don't think we need to take a more critical stance towards this? I mean, you don't think it's 
either good or bad for the country to have the media splintering like this because some of the effects that go along with it is that people have different conceptions of what the truth is, different conceptions of what the facts are. They tend to have a more bubbled existence. They tend because, uh, and you can disagree with any of this, they tend because they're hanging out in like-minded communities to engage in group polarization. You know, you said at the end of the book, you asked the question, which unconstrained institution poses the greatest danger to the body politic? A hyper-partisan media flailing to retain readers and viewers or a presidency with direct access to tens of millions of admirers? I mean, so I just wonder whether, are you neutral about this change? Do you think it's bad for the country? I absolutely think that the divisiveness that afflicts the society now is uh, dangerous and never more so than in the midst of a pandemic when health recommendations are politicized, as we've seen. So I think, you know, I'm not going to make an excuse of saying the book was written before the pandemic but it was, but of course it's unhealthy. But I also, you know, looking at the long view, we, in the era of hyper-partisanship, we managed to elect Abraham Lincoln as a leader who, who oversaw the greatest crisis and the greatest threat to democracy in American history. So I think partisan journalism is not automatically bad. The difference is in the Lincoln era, you either read a Republican newspaper or a Democratic paper. And those papers were openly and proudly aligned. I'm waiting for the day when CNN declares itself a, a force aligned with the Democratic Party. I mean, if we can't go back to the days of Walter Cronkite and um, Howard K. Smith and others, then, then maybe people should be aware of the specifics of who they're watching and make the identities more uh, a requirement. You don't think it's kind of obvious? Sure, it's obvious, but it was why was it proudly uh, bannered in the 19th century and is so reluctantly admitted to? Why did Fox News begin with uh, its its existence by saying that they were a um, a truth teller that the news was that it's all the fairest news coverage ever? I mean, I just think there's a bit of phoniness involved on both sides, and I would like to see either. I mean, I don't think we're going to get a return to nonpartisan journalism any time soon. I absolutely believe that what you said was right, and I end my my book with a reminder that uh, Pat Moynihan said that you can argue about opinions, but you can't argue about facts. But we do argue about facts, and, and we're groping now for a way for uh, social media platforms to address misstatements, lies, and incendiary commentary. I think that that's a big fight going forward. Yeah. So the the quote. The sentence after you quote Pat Moynihan, and I'll end the interview here, the, the sentence after the Moynihan quote is, the Trump era may usher in a permanent upheaval in which Americans never again agree on basic information or trust in traditional news services. How likely is that to happen? How much of what we've been experiencing is due to Trump, and how much is what we've been experiencing due to larger structure and structural and technological factors? And what is your, what is your prediction? So will we go back to a time when the press is respected as an as an arbiter, as well as an honest broker of news? Um, are we going to go back to a day when the courts are viewed as fair arbiters of truth, when Congress is viewed as the local uh, voice and contributor to the federal wheel? Uh, I don't know. I think all of these institutions have been chipped away at over the years. And I, I wish I had the crystal ball to say which is, what's going to snap first, our cynicism or our, our hope for a, a better informed respect for our institutions. I just don't know. And I think a lot, you know, not to be hyperpartisan myself, a lot depends on how we judge the campaigns of the fall of 2020. Do we want to go back to so I take a deep breath and step into the light, or do we want to continue to attack the institutions that we all grew up with and had some faith in? I think that's a big decision to be made. And, and as President Trump usually says at least once in every news conference, we'll see what happens. That's a great place to stop. Harold Holzer, thank you so much, and thanks for writing such a great book. Thank you for inviting me on. I appreciate it.
The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please share the Lawfare Podcast and give us a five-star review on iTunes. Go to thelawfarestore.com for brand new Lawfare pens, lanyards, t-shirts, and socks. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell, and your audio engineer was Zachary Frank of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening. ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. Hi there, I'm Kendra Adachi, and I'm the host of the Lazy Genius Podcast, a weekly show helping you be a genius about the things that matter and lazy about the things that don't. Everything can't matter, right? Otherwise, you turn into a robot trying to do it all. So why not name what matters to you? And I'd love to help. New episodes drop every Monday morning, but there's a back catalog of over 200 episodes that will help you create systems and soul and everything from how you do laundry and how you cook chicken to how you navigate making new friends and even having tough family conversations. Embrace what matters, ditch what doesn't, and get stuff done with the Lazy Genius Podcast. ACAST, A-cast. 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 A-cast.